Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing more footage of Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. We're also going to be looking at some footage of Jody Hildebrandt's niece, Jessie Hildebrandt, during an interview. For most of you that are watching this video, you probably already know that Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frankie have both been accused of felony child abuse. What we're going to be looking at today is more footage from the Connections Classroom. In addition to that, afterward, we're going to explore some of Jessie Hildebrandt's interview, and I'll give you my impressions of that interview. Last thing before we get started, I do want to remind you that this is not a psychological evaluation. These are just my opinions based on publicly available information. In addition to that, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. We're going to be watching clips from several different videos. This one is supposed to be on enabling. To what is going on inside them that's motivating this presentation, whatever presentation it is. I'm curious. If they're screaming and yelling, I'm interested in, in what's motivating them to scream and yell. Somebody who's screaming and yelling could have an absolute truthful reason why they're screaming and yelling. So here you see her talking about with a lot of energy that screaming and yelling can be an appropriate response. I want you to think about this because this is going to matter as we continue to watch more of this footage. But she's explaining how screaming and yelling can be a very legitimate response to certain situations. Let's watch this part again and we'll keep going. If they're screaming and yelling, I'm interested in, in what's motivating them to scream and yell. Somebody who's screaming and yelling could have an absolute truthful reason why they're screaming and yelling. And also, if you look at her body language, she has her body very open right now. This is something when we really want to emphasize, when we want people to believe us, when we want to connect with people. So right now, this is really important to her as she's talking about the screaming and yelling. She wants this message to come across to people. And most people would say, well, they're screaming and yelling. Stop them you know, cover them up. Don't let them, you know, have access to that anymore. And the truth is, why? What is it? Truth or distortion that's motivating them? What's enabling them? Truth or distortion? There's. So when she's talking about this, it's of all the things that she questions, because she questions a lot about choices people make, decisions people make, parenting choices about helping your children. But the one thing right now that she's talking about that is fully okay is seeing someone scream and yell. Why would you question that? Why would you stop that? It's really interesting that that these sorts of things leak out and that that's what she thinks is important to focus on. And if I'm going to go back, watch Ruby Frankie during this. Just focus on her side for a minute. Is it truth or distortion that's motivating them? What's enabling them? Truth or distortion? And this is something that she seems to connect with. She's nodding her head. There are times where they say things where their body language is not in sync, where they seem to disagree, but this is something they both seem to be into. There is a, a principle, mm -hmm. a... Uh, headmaster who posted a picture and I want to share it with you. Okay. So I want you to keep this in mind. So I'm going to skip over some of this because this is just going to get really long if I don't, because they read a whole lot, but basically they're talking about how screaming and yelling is fine. And that segues into children forgetting their lunch. All right. Basically she says that a headmaster said that if a kid forgets their lunch too bad, they're going to have to learn from it. And they'll just have to be hungry to sort of paraphrase what's said. I'm going to skip past that, and we're going to talk about their reaction to this. I read that, and I was like, yeah! All right, so this is a real feeling of exuberance when she read that, something that legitimizes her position. Somebody else that takes the idea that not letting your kids eat is okay sometimes. Let's keep watching, and we're going to talk more about this. That's awesome. I love that. And that goes for girls, too. They talked about sons, but this is daughters as well. And so the response, there were probably about 11 responses when we read that, and nine out of the 11 were, how dare that headmaster? I would never send my child to that school. My kid will be hungry. And it was just all this reaction yeah. to this principal who was loving. So look at the face of Ruby Frankie right now. If you look at the corners of her mouth, this is a look of disgust. The idea that people are, are, are suggesting that this principal is wrong in his position is disgusting to her. Let, let's go back and just watch this facial expression again. All this reaction yeah. to this principal who was loving these boys and these girls. He was enabling him. He was empowering them. The parents' view in this situation is really myopic. They are only looking at the here and the now. The more she talks about this, watch Ruby Frankie's face. Like her eyebrows are starting to, to face down a little bit more. I think that there is genuine frustration. There may be some real anger about this topic below the surface because oftentimes she has these big smiles. Right now, it looks like this is a subject that agitates her. Well, the instant gratification of their child. 
their stomachs are going to be hungry. They're going to go three hours without eating. Right. And they're also looking at their discomfort as well. They may not be conscientious. The parents are uncomfortable. And this is something that they're connecting on. Watch this right here. Stomachs are going to be hungry. They're going to go three hours without eating. Right. And they're also looking at their discomfort as well. So this seems to be something they really connect on. Like they're looking at each other. They're agreeing with everything each other's saying. This is something, there's a synergy between them when it comes to this type of behavior. They may not be conscientious. The parents are uncomfortable. My child's not eating. Now I'm uncomfortable. And so it's not just their kid. They're also looking at their own discomfort. They're trying to. So basically what they're saying is that if your child feels something negative, then you shouldn't feel anything. It's training people to go against their own instincts. And that's what's so interesting is so much of what they talk about with the ideas of truth and distortion, words that I'm starting to dislike because they use them so much, <laughs> that the way they talk about it basically is anything you think or feel, any natural instincts you have as a parent, you should fight against because any type of caring you show is going to be enabling bad behavior. And the child is not going to be enabled to see, oh, the choices that I made to go to sleep last night late led to the outcomes of me sleeping in and then I didn't get a breakfast and then I forgot a lunch and now I'm going to go all day hungry. I don't know why she's so obsessed with this idea of going all day hungry. If you really truly care about kids and want to help them learn consequences, why them starving all day is something that she brings up in her other videos, she brings up in this video. It's such a big theme for her. The, the, the parents are stepping in and interfering with the um with that natural that they have that natural procession of choice and outcome choice and outcome because they're too worried about their own discomfort and their child going hungry well if the child really did go a few hours without eating and that was a reminder to the child that my choices have consequences isn't that a beautiful exchange so now they're masking what could arguably be something that could be considered abusive. I'm sure there's people that would argue it one way or the other. My point is not to argue that. But masking what your child not eating all day is a beautiful exchange. You want to talk about a distortion, and that is incredibly distorted. What a, what a wonderful gift that I get to learn that my choices have outcomes. And, and also framing it as a gift. Personally, I find this disgusting. I really do. And it's not just that they feel this way themselves, the idea that they're trying to educate other people. Fight against your instincts to treat your children well. For a small price of, I went a few hours without eating. What a, what a, what a very affordable lesson to learn right there. And the headmaster sees that. This is a really affordable time for children to learn these lessons instead of waiting until they get into their 40s and 50s. And, and then the outcome. Your job is the wife. That's <laughs> you get to be the second mother Did if you, you, know that? you marry a boy like that. All right, so here we go. If you don't treat your kids in this abusive way, you're going to have a child that grows up to be a child and has to be mothered by their wife. I mean, that's in essence the logic that we're following here. So now I'm going to show a video where they discuss sexuality. What they talk about disturbs me profoundly. I'm not going to comment on the body language of this part. I'm just going to let you hear it. Then I'm going to talk about it. And there is a reason I'm showing this. It's going to connect to something later that Jesse Hildebrandt talks about. Let's just hear what they have to say. When a, a child goes into the room and they put order where there once was chaos and they put the toys away and they hold their bed tight and they fluff up their pillow and they organize all. How many of your children have done this where they take their all of their animals and their stuffed animals and dolls and they they order them, they put order to it and then they step back and and they feel really good about it. Right. That's an act of being sexual. Exactly. That is an expression of who they are. I'm truly struggling to put into words how disturbing this is. I really am because this is factually wrong. There's nothing psychologically accurate about what she's describing. There's no theory behind anything that she's saying. This is wrong. What she is talking about is non-sexual. There's nothing sexual about this other than any feelings that the two of them are projecting onto that situation because she is describing a literal non-sexual situation. And really, it is damaging, destructive, and scary, frankly, that they are teaching people this, that other people could possibly listen to that and believe it and implement these thoughts and feelings into their own life. That is terrifying because what she is saying is wrong, and I want to be very, 
very clear on that. I also think that it's extremely important that you see the connection that this later has to something that Jesse Hildebrandt talks about. Before we get to the Jesse Hildebrandt video, we're going to watch Ruby Frankie talking about why she didn't give two of her kids Christmas presents, because this was brought up in my last video. We, we told these two um, what our expectations were again, and we let them know how deeply sorrowful we've been because of the choices that they've been making. So uh, part of the challenge with the things that they present, particularly when they talk about kids, is they present things and interventions that are not developmentally appropriate or sensible. So they go, we're going to do this to the kids and they're going to make get all these ideas from it and they're going to understand it. Kids' minds don't work that way. So they're trying to treat children as though they are adults and it doesn't make any sense. And that's something that Jody Hildebrandt does consistently through every single video. She talks about kids as it doesn't matter if they're two, they're going to get this and this is how they're going to think or how they should think. And children aren't capable of thinking in these ways. Developmentally, it just doesn't work that way. L let's keep going. This year, they are not going to be visited by Santa. So she seems to be genuinely amused by the idea of doing this. She's taking away what she sees as something joyous. And that is sadistic. When you can feel any joy or pleasure from someone else's pain, that is sadism. Them to really have a visceral experience that hits them. So up until now, I was really hoping that like keeping them home from school and wiping the floorboards would like really bring pain. Like, like, oh my gosh, I really want to. So pain, that's why I referred to sadism. She was hoping it would really bring pain. Pain is such a strange word when it comes to the idea of discipline. So usually parents don't talk about wanting to bring their children pain. It really is a strange way to frame this change this behavior that I've been exhibiting <clears throat> and it didn't it didn't they like it wasn't painful for them they're like oh yeah we get to stay home from school and clean floorboards this is kind of fun it's like and once again that shows the motivation is pain is the motivation it's not painful enough they haven't affected them it's because they're so numb and so the more numb your child is the greater experience the big the bigger the outcome they all right now watch your expression right here the greater experience See, there was a look of contempt and then a chuckle. So the idea that this experience has to be huge to be impactful, there's something about that that actually made her laugh. The bigger the outcome, they need to wake them up. <laughs> you're, you're not going to push a boulder with just your hands. You need. So she, the more pain she's talking about inflicting, that when she says wake them up, literally, those are her words. She wants to inflict pain. And to her, that made her chuckle. So I think that that speaks to some concerning perspective that she has on this. I'm really I love your soul more than anything in this world. And I literally would do anything to, to invite you into repentance. And I know parents say that I'll do, I would do anything for my kid, but really what I think most parents are saying is I would give anything to you. If I, I would pay any price monetarily. I really don't think that is at all what parents mean when they say that. So that is our gift. Our gift is a reflection of truth. And so this, once again, as we saw in an earlier video, they're packaging, treating your children in this way as a gift. It's such an amazing thing to do for your children. And that is a very perverse way to look at exactly what she's talking about doing. Now we're going to watch part of an interview with Jesse Hildebrandt. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that I do believe that what she's saying is in fact true. Her body language is consistent with someone who is not showing any signs of deception. And in addition to that, thematically, there's some things that are very consistent with bits of video we just watched. Let's go ahead and watch her talk about what her experiences were with Jody Hildebrandt. And if I didn't say it already, this is in fact Jody Hildebrandt's niece. Yeah, I was I was left in her care when I was a teenager um, for a little under a year. The things that I experienced while living with Jody, I experienced being tied, I experienced being duct taped, I experienced being blindfolded, I experienced uh, severe isolation, I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. So if we're to look at her body language as she talks about this, you know, she's using her hands for emphasis. She seems to really feel a lot of what she's talking about. You know, once again, I don't really typically analyze victims a lot, so I'm not going to provide a deep analysis of this other than I will tell you I don't see any signs of deception. The way that she's emphatic, the way that her body has been open, the way that she's consistent with the way that she speaks, there's nothing that she shies away from or tries to ignore. The way that she does this really does show somebody 
who is talking about memories they've had, experiences they've had, the way that they bring these things up does not seem the same as someone who is fa fabricating things or coming up with things on the spot. I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. I experienced um, the being told I, I, I shouldn't be around other people, being told that I was dangerous to be around. If I, if someone wanted, if someone spoke to me directly, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth. Um, All right. Now see the way that she did that. I was, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth, the way that that naturally came out, that looks like it's going back to a memory, which is something else that lends credence to the fact that these are things that she has experienced. And based on what she's saying, I have no reason to question any of this. If someone spoke to me directly, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth, um, I had to just stare at them and not respond. She also, and this is like a, a very deep connection and why I chose to come forward to the media rather than just staying with the podcast. Um, she accused me of being a sex addict. She accused me of being uh, addicted to masturbation to the point where I wasn't allowed to, I, I mentioned this on the podcast, to the point where I wasn't allowed to use tampons. Um, I never was allowed privacy unless I was isolated. So that included the bathroom. I was never allowed to have the door closed. So hearing her talk about this, particularly in the context of the clip I showed earlier, goes to suggest that sometimes they may overly sexualize things that are in no way, shape, or form sexual. The clip I showed earlier was the worst possible example I can think of of suggesting something that could be considered a sexual act. But that's consistent with what she's saying now, which is managing her period is going to be somehow seen as sexual. Like It's so bizarre and so deranged, yet so consistent with the idea of over-sexualizing things that are in no way, shape, or form sexual. Jesse Hildebrandt does appear to be a, a, a believable historian. There's nothing that she said that had me questioning whether or not any of it was true. It fits the patterns and themes and logic with other things that have been discussed by them on the Connections Classroom. The most concerning thing is the idea that they are teaching people to engage in these behaviors, to abandon any sort of parental instincts that they have, to push away any feelings of any closeness, and to engage in pain and punishment. That's the way that I interpreted it. If other people have different interpretations, please let me know. But it's hard for me to interpret it any other way. I know this was sort of a long video, but I wanted to make sure that you could see that I wasn't taking anything out of context, and I think that they represent them well. I know that this story is long from being over, so I'm sure that I will revisit it again. My next video is going to be on cults and how they control people. In the meantime, if there are other things you want me to cover, other cases, if there's more you want me to do about this or there's a specific video you want me to look at, please let me know. Last thing before we get finished up is I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, thanks for watching.